Simpson's Golden Thread. Bits, pieces, and joining the dots. Hiya, uh, my name's Catherine and I am presenting this talk today on behalf of the Harris Museum, Library and Art Gallery in Preston in Lancashire. So I'm going to start by telling you a quick story. So a few years ago, I was at a car boot, a big car boot just outside of Preston. And I saw what I thought was a really interesting sewing kit. Uh, the reason I thought it was a sewing kit is because I could see bobbins and spools and feathers and things like that. But when I got closer to it, I realised it wasn't a sewing kit at all. It was a fishing kit. So the things that I had seen were used to make shimmery, beautiful, attractive baits in order to catch fish. I bought the kit. I sold a few of the bits and pieces in the kit. I used some in arts and crafts that I did. But there was one particularly beautiful bobbin of golden thread. And I just popped this on one of my shelves as an ornament. Well, as you know, our memory, our mind, our sight is working all the time, even when we're not really asking it to do anything. So something about that beautiful bobbin of thread must have etched itself onto my mind's eye because over the coming couple of years, in things that I wrote, in things that I drew and in things that I painted and imagery that I used, the idea of golden thread kept popping up. So I talked about golden thread at my cousin's wedding. Me and my son did a reading together and we referenced golden thread and how it's kind of an ethereal entity that joins two souls together. I wrote a letter recently um, that referenced golden thread as something that connects the hearts and souls of every being. And if all these connections are made, then this will form like a kind of gigantic golden net of protection around the universe. The third reference to golden thread shall be kept a secret until the end of the talk. So you'll have to wait and see for that one. Now, I spoke about joining up dots. One of the biggest dots in my life is Preston. I love it. I love the home city where I live. And one of the smaller dots within that city is the Harris. Introducing the Harris. Here it is. It's a neoclassical style building that was officially opened in 1893. It took 11 years to build and was funded by money bequested to Preston by a Preston lawyer, Edmund Joseph Harris. I came here a lot when I was a child to change books. The books I read helped me learn about the world, but also form an image of a world that I wanted to live in. My first date was at the Harris. My then boyfriend persuaded me to take some overdue library books back with him. It was very romantic indeed. This is a giant installation of the moon that the Harris Museum housed. As you can see, very lifelike. I've embraced my Viking side at the Harris, as has my son Samuel. That helmet was very heavy on his head. I had a picture hung at the Harris Open Exhibition, which they hold every year. You pay a small amount of money and you can hang one of your own creations. As you can probably tell, I'm a bit of a Harris super fan. I missed it a lot when it had to shut because of the recent COVID lockdown. So I spent some time looking at the exhibitions online. There's quite a lot of items that the Harris holds on their website. Imagine my sheer shock and delight to discover this. An exhibition piece of 1980s Simpsons of Preston golden thread bobbins. They looked incredible. I wanted to find out more. So I did. From this book, The Firm of Stephen Simpson, and from this brilliant woman, local historian Linda Barton, who embarked upon a lengthy and very comprehensive historical investigation of Simpsons. 
She used primary and secondary research. She spoke to ex-employees. And what she told me, what was so brilliant about Simpsons, was the way in which they took the very basic raw materials and from scratch took them through all the manufacturing processes to produce the most sublime, delicate and intricate golden thread products you could imagine. These are some examples of the types of thread that they used in all their different products. And we're going to find out more about the kind of work they did and the kind of organisations, both open and covert, that they supplied. Let's meet the founder. This is Isaac Simpson. Like his father before him, Stephen Simpson, Isaac was originally a clockmaker. He invented a way to harness steam power in order to flatten metal to make gold plate. This flatter metal was then fashioned into the finest metal strips, which was wrapped around cotton thread to make the beautiful golden thread that you see in the exhibition pieces. Isaac invented and patented this spinning machine. He was incredibly protective and secretive about his creations and his design ideas to the point where he did all the work himself to avoid anyone finding out his secrets. Alas, when the volume of work became too much for him, he took on this lady, Martha Riley. In his centenary book celebrating 100 years of the Golden Thread Works, Stephen Simpson explains that Martha was made to sign a solemn promise before she started work for Isaac Simpson to not divulge anything related to the business. This was in 1836 when Martha was 16. She remained with the firm until her retirement in 1881 after 44 years of service. He writes in his book that Martha was in every way a wonderful woman and it was reported that she could tell by touch if a piece of gold thread had been made at Simpsons or elsewhere. Her manager would sometimes test her knowledge and she was always correct with her answers. The story of Martha Riley is a really interesting one because it highlights to me one of the fundamental things that success, and it was very, very successful company, that the success of Simpsons was based on. And it was this idea of trust and faithfulness between employer and employee. So Martha was made to sign a solemn promise to state that she wouldn't share any of the firm's secrets. What I also learned when I spoke to Linda Barton was that each department within the factory didn't really know what other departments did. So departments were kept very separate. This again helped maintain that privacy and secrecy between these processes. And I guess if you think about the context of the time, industrialization, um, people would have been protective over their industry. It was flourishing and it was new and people weren't quite sure how to protect the success that they had. Simpsons really did though. So as well as basing their success on this trust of employees, and employees that worked for them for such a long time. They also firmly embedded this idea of quality, of time spent and of pride in your work. So whether you agree with it or not, they did have some um, quite harsh working conditions. So, for example, when the young women, and they were often very young women, as young as 10, um, took on their apprenticeship with Simpsons, they wouldn't be paid for the first year of training. Also, um, if a bit worker was off sick or pregnant and they couldn't provide work, they couldn't complete any work, they weren't paid. They were only paid for the work they produced. And they were only paid for the work they produced if the work was up to standard. If it wasn't, if there were mistakes, 
then the work was discarded and they wouldn't be paid. So what evolved was this tremendously skilled, dedicated workforce. And this obviously proved very successful in terms of the contracts that the firm won. It took over a number of large gold thread firms. So it took over Turner and Van in London. And that's when it kind of really hit the big time because it had a London base. So the Preston Chronicle in 1884, and this is taken again from the centenary book, comments on the subtlety and almost obtrusiveness of the works buildings, saying that, you know, unless you knew what happened in those buildings, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't be able to guess. So the quote is, it is hard to say what different minds on the first blush might imagine them to be. But the initiated know them to be the gold thread manufacturing works of Stephen Simpson of Avonham Road, Preston. Famous in every quarter of the civilised globe for the artistic excellence and durability of goods they turn out. So there's a testament indeed. And now I'm going to show you some more examples of the badge work of Simpsons and talk you through where they supplied them to. Here's a really early example of work. This is a cushion that was presented to King George V by the Royal Company of Archers. Um, and this is a picture in Stephen Simpson's centenary book. Here we have an example of an incredibly intricate um, coat of arms. Um, so there you can see the lion and the unicorn and the crown and the motto at the bottom, Dieu et mon droit. So that's um, a beautiful example of a military badge. Simpsons also provided badges for the Royal Navy as well as buttons. So the buttons here that you're about to see are made out of um, gold plate. Um, and Simpsons also provided badges for the White Star Ship Company um, that owned the Titanic that sank in 1912. The next example of work are these Masonic cuffs, which incorporate the bird of peace design. So these are really clear examples of different types of embroidery used by Simpsons um, seamstresses. Here is the apron as well. So you've got the rough pearl, the pearl pearl um, design. I think this has to be my favourite badge of the collection. So this is from the 1922 Preston Guild uh, procession. This was Simpson's amalgamated trade badge. And there you can clearly see uh, the Lamb of Preston, um, the PP standing for Proud Preston or Prince of Peace and uh, the rosette and the flag there. Um, I just think that's a beautiful example of work. So a fascinating bit of Simpsons history draws again on this idea of secrecy and trust and also the need for absolute skilled workmanship. So there you can see some Luftwaffe German military Nazi badges. So during World War Two, the Dutch allies stole aluminium thread from a factory in Germany, took it to the war office, and it was then transported to Simpsons. And there, in a secret room, these replica badges were made for the British spies to put on their fake Nazi um, military uniforms um, for when they were going undercover. And... At one point, just before the Normandy landings, most of the 450 staff of Simpsons were engaged in creating these badges. And Ivy Norcross um, was a woman who was engaged in this and reports that she had to sign the Official Secrets Act before she was able to undertake this work. So very exciting stuff. And really, a matter of life and death, potentially. So there you go. A potted history of Simpsons. You can access 
all the primary research carried out by Linda Barton from the Lancashire Archives, if you were more interested. And there is still the exhibition in the social history part of the Harris Museum. The factory closed in 1991. And I'm about to show you some pictures of what the area looks like now. I went there today and I fell in love with it. So this is the back of the original factory. And this is where it makes me realise how unassuming the buildings were, as we discussed earlier in the talk. This is the front and the sign is still proudly there on the front of the building. And there you can see the blue plaque. So Preston has the blue plaque system um, of key historical buildings and historical figures. Um, so this is the dedication to Isaac Simpson, um, the founder of the works, and his son Stephen, who took over the factory um, for the majority of its time. So this funky piece of sculpture is the dedication to the Simpsons factory, which can be found on Avenham Road. And I never knew about this and I absolutely love it. I think it's a brilliant um, testimony to the works of the factory and what it will have brought to the local area. So it's a giant bobbin, a giant needle, and then a thread of gold thread, which kind of forms into um, sculpture at the base of the frame around the tree. So you can see there, um, I love it. And I just want to say a big thank you for watching it all to the very end. I promised you the third reference to Golden Thread that I recently created. So I took the Simpsons bobbins that I originally fell in love with from the exhibition as a bit of inspiration and created a piece of art based on that. So first I'm going to show you some footage about my technique, which I like to call bits and pieces art. It's a mashup of art, painting, drawing and collage and it's kind of whatever you want it to be. It uses raw materials so it's kind of reflective of Simpsons in that way. It follows the journey of taking raw materials from around my home and just using my imagination and a bit of spare time to just create something that is full of kind of hidden meaning for me I guess. So it's another way that I can join up my dots. So have a look at this footage and see what you think. Just before I introduce you to the final piece of artwork, I just want to say a big thank you to the Harris for this opportunity and also a big up to everybody who's going to be involved in Preston's bid for the 2025 City of Culture. I'm really excited and I think we're in with a really good chance. So here's my contribution to the campaign. This is Trust the golden thread of life by me i hope you like it and then what i'll do in a minute because there's quite a lot of detail to take in is take a little video showing you a little bit more detail but thanks ever so much for watching this video i've really enjoyed making it and i hope you've enjoyed watching it and look forward to seeing you again sometime take care bye bye Whenever I see you, all I can think is my summer love.